Hi there. Thank you for being patient and waiting on the Eyes and Ears podcast. Um, I wanted to add some extra content in here, so I hope it is much improved. So we're going to talk about eyes and ears. And with eyes and ears, the most common things that you're going to see are infectious processes like conjunctivitis in the eyes, and then, of course, the good old ear infections, otitis media in the ears. That's probably what you'll see the most often, especially if you're in primary care or um, you probably have experienced at least one ear infection if you have kids of your own. So we're going to talk about the most common things that you'll see. And some variation in the pediatric anatomy. One thing you need to remember is visual acuity is not perfect until about the time they enter kindergarten. Six or seven years old, um, that's usually your baseline. So things can get better or things can get worse up until that point. Um, ability to focus does come pretty early, about four months of age. So infants can follow um, an object. And that's one of the things that you want to look at when you're when you're looking at your growth and development, if they can follow an object. Um, hearing is intact at birth, and I'm not going to read these slides um, word for word. You can read them word for word. I would suggest that. Uh, but hearing at birth is intact. Um, those of you that have kids know that they do a hearing test. And then if they don't pass their hearing test, then... Um, they do a little bit more investigative work, um, you know, whether it's a sensory neural loss or it may be a conductive loss or it may be nothing. It may be the child just didn't didn't respond well to the hearing test. So they usually repeat those if they're unsuccessful. One thing about kids, about their ears, that you need to remember, their eustachian tubes. So kids get more ear infections than adults. Reason being, they've got these short, little, wide, horizontal eustachian tubes. As we get older, our eustachian tubes kind of thin out and kind of angle down. So all of that fluid behind your ear can drain out. Well, kids, they've got this flat, little, almost retrograde situation happening. And fluid builds up behind their ears, and there's really no way for it to drain. So ear infect bacteria gets behind there. They love that pus and stuff that's back there behind the eardrum and so infection ensues. So remember that it's a structural issue that predisposes kids versus adults to ear infections. Alright, some congenital things that you might see and we're just going to briefly mention these. I'm not going to really talk about cataracts or infantile glaucoma. Just know that they're out there and they're congenital. Uh, prematurity, retinopathy of prematurity, we'll touch on just a tad bit. Um, genetic orders, family history, those are all important when you're looking at eyes and ears in children. All right, when you're looking at eyes, um, now one of the things that you want to look at the eyes, you want to make sure that they're symmetrical and make sure they're not too broadly spaced. You want to look for any strabismus, lazy eye, um, when you do your assessment, remember way back in assessment when you, when you did your ocular fields and things like that, you want to look for any kind of lazy eye or muscle weakness at that point. Nystagmus, you'll see nystagmus. I don't know if anyone's ever seen nystagmus, but it's, it's kind of funky. Um, their eyes kind of go back and forth when they're trying to focus. And then squinting, of course, look for that because you may have some refractive errors going on there. Uh, make sure their eyelids, have them open their eyes real wide and make sure that they're even. Um, if there's a slant or an epicanthal fold, then that might indicate something else going on. So you always will, would want to um, investigate those. And then if they're there for any kind of infectious process, you want to look at their eyelid. Make sure you look at their sclera and their conjunctiva and make sure that there's no discharge or what color the discharge is. Check the pupils, etc. All of those good assessment techniques that Dr. Dombrowski taught you. All right, some things that you might see as far as testing, of course, visual acuity testing, you know, the cover the right eye, cover the left eye, 20, 20, 20, 50, whatever that. Um, and that's interesting to do in kids. They say that you can actually do that at for a three-year-old. And they have those visual acuity charts that um, have pictures on them instead of letters. So... 
I, I've never personally done one on a three-year-old, but they say it can be done. Um, audiometry and tympanometry, if you're looking for, if you have like a, plur, uh, not a plural effusion, if you have a um, ear effusion, a middle ear effu effusion, uh, you may want to do some tympano tympanometry. Um, of course, looking in those ears with an otoscope, and you'll see some good pictures here in a minute about uh, with the ear infection, what you're going to see. And then if we're unsuccessful at treating ear infections, sometimes they do a tympanic fluid culture. They may actually have to go in there and open up that tympanic membrane and um, gather a little bit of that fluid for a culture to make sure they're getting the right antibiotic. Some things that you might see as far as examining the eyes, um, any, the extraocular movements like you learned back in assessment, uh, pupillary, make sure you check your pupils and make sure that they're reactive and accommodating. Now this is really important, the symmetry of the corneal light reflex. So think way back to assessment when you looked at the cornea. You hold the light out and that light should, should shine on the same spot on both eyes. If it doesn't, then there may be some musculature weakness in there that needs to be um, further investigated. All right, presence of red reflex. Okay, so when you look in inside your pupil of your eye, now this is a really hard exam to to complete, and I don't I don't know if you guys did it back in assessment, but we didn't we don't do it much as a pediatric nurse. As a pediatric nurse practitioner, I did, um, but it's a hard. I mean, if you've ever had it done to yourself, it's hard. You have to have your patient hold their eye open, and you get real close with that ophthalmoscope, and you look for the red reflex. Red re reflex is good. White reflex is bad. Um, a white reflex is called is referred to the the comp the proper name is leukocoria, and it could indicate that there's a retinoblastoma. So if you see, and that's most commonly what it does. It can indicate other things, but retinoblastoma is the first thing you think about when you, if you see a white reflex. Um, the age-appropriate visual acuity, we talked about that. You can use one with pictures on it, or you can um, actually do it with the letters with older kids. If you have any kind of injury or um laceration to the eye or any kind of trauma to the face, you always want to do a visual acuity. All right, when you're looking in the ear, so what you might see are those nasty waxy ears. My son had one waxy ear and one unwaxy ear. So some kids just produce a lot more wax than others. Um, irrigating ears was one of the things that we did most commonly in the emergency department. So you want to look for wax, you want to look for discharge, you want to look for inflammation, foreign bodies, my favorite thing to do. Um, kids put everything in their ear and in their nose. So getting things and finding interesting things in the ear like popcorn and rocks and Barbie shoes and Lego pieces. Fabulous. So that's a possibility. If you have a kiddo coming in with ear pain, and you're not quite sure and they're three or four years old, you might have a foreign body in that ear. Um, to visualize the tympanic membrane, a little bit difficult. Uh, I think you guys played with the otoscope in, in assessment, but you want to look for color, you want to look for landmarks, you want to see your light reflex and that fluid behind it. There should be some fluid behind it, but it needs to be clear. All right, some things that we might do for any kind of eye and ear disorders, and we'll get into more specific disorders here in a second, but you might use a warm compress, especially if you have like a conjunctivitis. A warm compresses help. Corrective lenses if you have refractive errors. Patching. Okay, so patching. We used to patch eyes when we had when they had a corneal abrasion, but then you'll see in the book, and I'll point it out, that there's a study, or there was a couple of studies, that um, did not did not really back that up. So they no longer patch corneal abrasions. They do use patching, like for um, amblyopia. Um, you know, some sort of if they have to cover an eye to make the other eye stronger, they they sometimes use patching now. Um, eye muscle surgery again. If there's a lazy eye or if there's a musculature thing going on with the eye, they may have surgery for the to correct that musc that muscle weakness. PE tubes very 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 common in kids. 
especially with lots of ear infections. A lot of uh, primary care physicians have like, oh, you've got 10 ear infections, so we're going to do tubes, or you got two ear infections, we're going to do. So a lot of different um, ideas on that. But putting in tubes is a, a very easy, quick um, procedure now. They do it outpatient, and there are some precautions that you have to take afterwards. Uh, most of the time, those tubes fall out at about, oh, I don't know, nine months to a year. And what, what they do is they put a tiny little tube in the very bottom. If you're looking at an eardrum, about six o'clock, they put a, a little tiny tube in so that that fluid can drain and the pressure can normalize. And as the eardrum regenerates, that little tube moves up the clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. So it kind of grows in a circle and then it just kind of works its way out. They are tiny little bobbin looking things. If anybody's ever seen one, almost look like a little grommet. Tiny, tiny, tiny. They fall out on their own most of the time. Um, and like I said, lifetime of a tube is about a year. Um, hearing aids and cochlear implants, you might see those if you have a, um, a hearing deficit in your children. Some medications that we use. You see a lot of antibiotics. Probably overuse of antibiotics, especially with um, ear infections. About 75% of ear infections are viral. However, given the close proximity of the ear to the brain, most primary care people treat ear infections with antibiotics. Um, in Europe, they don't treat them unless they rupture, like the tympanic membrane ruptures. They don't treat them with antibiotics. But here, yeah, we treat everything with pink stuff, moxicillin. Um, bacterial conjunctivitis, of course, antibiotic drops or ointment to the eye. Antihistamines, if they have an allergic conjunctivitis, then you might see some topical drops. And then pain relief. Ear infections hurt. Um, babies don't want to eat. It's really, really, really painful. So important to treat the pain with, um, with ear infections. Now, also, Otitis externa, swimmer's ear, that's painful too. So make sure that you guys encourage your par your parents to treat the pain. All right, so here's a question about visual disorders. Um, the most common visual disorder in kids is refractive errors, and that is true. Um, just like in adults, refractive errors, and that just means we need some glasses or contacts. Retinopathy of prematurity. We're going to touch on this just briefly because when you have a premature baby, um, of course, things don't form like they should. These are all risk factors for retinopathy. Of course, low birth weight, um, sepsis, um, hypothermia, hypoxia. If you have to have supplemental oxygen, those all can cause eye problems. And so with a premature baby, it's really important to have them followed by the ophthalmologist. Some things that might increase the risk for just visual de development, um, genetic things, developmental delay, diabetes, and that's a big one. Kids with, with type 1 diabetes, um, make sure that they are following up with their eye doctors because, you know, diabetes can affect the, the vision. Chronic steroid use. If you have kids that have to be on steroids for a long period of time with respiratory issues or um, kidney issues, then really important to have them followed by an ophthalmologist as well. All right, some signs and symptoms of visual impairment. Remember I said that when you when you approach a system, you kind of want to know what you might see with that assessment of that system. So these are some things to look for that might indicate some sort of visual issue. If they don't track and they don't follow, um, that could be important. If they, if your corneal light reflex is uneven, that's important. Um, if they just stare and you just, they don't focus, then that's important too. So real important to assess that at each, each visit, um, especially in the infant and the toddler stage. Okay. Um, some common eye or disorders, refractive errors, we talked about that might just uh, be an easy fix with some glasses or some um, contacts. Astigmatism, astigmatism usually presents as blurred vision, and what that means is your cornea is just misshapen. A lot of times that, or most times that's in older adults, but you can have that in kids. Uh, and they just say it's a blurry vision. It's not nearsightedness. It's not farsightedness. It's just blurry all the time. 
Strabismus and amblyopia, uh, lazy eye. So you might have esotropia or exotropia. So if their eyes point in, eso, out, exo. Okay, and what they may be one of each. So real important to do those those visual fields and watch your kid track an an object. Nystagmus we talked about is the back and forth uh, motion, and glaucoma and cataracts very un uncommon in kids. All right, so here is what you're going to see the most with eyes. You're going to see conjunctivitis. Three types of conjunctivitis: and uh, bacterial, viral, and allergic. A lot of times they're hard to tell apart. Bacterial, you have more of that green crusty nastiness. Um, but you can have that with viral too. Allergic is most of the time just clear, clear, runny, runny, red eyes. Um, bacterial, of course, are treated with antibiotics. Viral, um, unless they're like, if they culture it and it's herpes or something like that, they usually won't treat with an antiviral um, antibi or an antiviral. They usually just let it run its course. Well, I, I say that. Most of the time they say, oh, it might be bacterial, and they'll put them on some antibiotics anyway. Um, you can treat with either, a, well, you can treat with either drops or ointment. With little ones, they tend to lean towards ointment. And one of the things about applying ointment, make sure that you, it's very, very difficult you have to pull out the bottom eyelid and do like a thin ribbon. I don't know why I'm pulling down my eyelid as I'm talking to you, but you put it like a thin ribbon of ointment in their eye and their vision is blurred for a while. That's why it works best in little ones. With bigger ones, bigger kids, drops are better. Again, don't touch that dropper to the eyelid because if it is bacterial, very contagious. Make sure you wash your hands before and after and to make sure you teach your parents the same thing. Allergic, not a lot to do. There are antihistamine eye drops that you can use. Um, sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. Oral antihistamines sometimes help as well. Periorbital cellulitis. Now, I think in the book there's a really good picture of periorbital cellulitis. So we're going to go to the book chapter here in just a second. This is bad. Okay, periorbital cellulitis is when you have looks like a big purple swelling of the of the eye around the around the eye it um, can develop into a pretty bad infection. So usually these kids come into the hospital and they get IV antibiotics. Um, it can be caused by external things like a bite or a scrape or internal things like a sinus infection. Um, some things that you might see with conjunctivitis, we talked about that, redness, you might see swelling, tearing, discharge. Um, again, with the bacteria, you'll see more of a yellow, crusty nastiness. And eyes usually itch with allergic conjunctivitis. All right, here's your different types and your different um, treatments. We've already hit on those. And then if you've got an allergic conjunctivitis, or say say your kiddo's allergic to cats or allergic to dogs, make sure you, and if this is hard to do, keep their hands out of their eyes. I was allergic to cats, I still am allergic to cats, and if I touch a cat and touch my eye, it is all over. Um, so make sure hand washing, all of that parent teaching is done. All right, some other things that you might see with the eye. Um, a sty, a chalazion, that may be chalazion. I've always pronounced it chalazion, but I could be wrong. Blepharitis and nasolacrimal duct stenosis. Um, for a sty and blep blepharitis, those are usually treated with an antibiotic. Um, a chalazion is, it, it's viral and it, it usually goes away on its own. Now, hard to differentiate between those two, so most of the time you're going to get an antibiotic ointment anyway. Um, nasolacrimal duct stenosis, you see that in little ones. Their little tear ducts get clogged up and they get like a crusty, crusty thing situation, swelling going on only in one eye. Massage, and uh, there's a picture in the book about how to do massage. We teach parents massage. If that doesn't work and it doesn't clear up, then sometimes they have to go in and put a little stent in there. Um, that's a little outpatient surgery, and they put a stent in there, and then that tear duct drains um, pretty easily. Some things that 
are out of our realm to treat, these need to be referred in their emergencies. So a traumatic hyphema, a blowout fracture, softballs, I've seen those, a ruptured globe, um, a foreign body or a foreign object, a nail or something that ruptures the globe, any kind of thermal energy or ther energy, injury, um, chemical injuries, things like that need to be referred on. Um, animal bites, I've seen some pretty nasty animal bites to the face. If your lid is lacerated and there's structural damage in the eye, and then the eyeball itself, bad. Um, for embedding, for body embedded in the globe, one time my husband got a piece of metal in his, um, in his eye and they had to take a little, it looked like a, if you all know what a Dremel tool is, like a little drill. Oh, it gives me the willies, and had to like drill it out. So they numb the eye up, they drill the metal piece out, and then he's in excruciating pain for about three or four days. So not a fun, not a fun situation. So those are all emergencies that need to be referred on. All right, let's talk about those ears. This is what the probably the most common diagnosis in kids is um, otitis media or ear infection. You have a different, a couple different otitises, otitises. Uh, you have AOM, which is the typical middle ear infection, otitis media with an effusion, and then otitis externa. So some of the risk factors, um, that eustachian tube placement, that's a big risk factor because it is so flat and almost retrograde. Um, recurrent upper respiratory infection. So everything is connected in the upper airway you've got your nose you've got your the drainage from your tear ducts um, and your ears it's all connected so if you get a little congested and your ear your eustachian tube becomes a little inflamed that fluid is trapped behind your ear bacteria like i said love that fluid so they just grow and grow and grow multiply 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 hence an ear infection if you're in daycare you're exposed to more of those lovely bacteria um, previous episode, once an ear infection, baby, it's pretty much, if you've got, you know, if you've got a little one that has one or two or three, the more you have, the more you get. Um, it just may be a structural thing. Um, tubes may be in that little baby's future. Um, but it tends to either they have no ear infections or they have, you know, two sets of tubes one into the other. Smoking in the household, smoking irritates those those tissues in there so it causes some swelling. Um, again, trapping that bacteria and that fluid behind the eardrums. Um, we talked about some testing. You can remember the whisper test back in um, assessment, um, the tuning forks, things like that. All right, here's some good pictures. So on the left is what you should see on the right is what you shouldn't see. You see all that nastiness behind the eardrum. You don't have to worry about learning those parts. Um, hearing loss. Hearing loss is measured in decibels, or, or sound, yeah, sound is measured in decibels. Hearing acuity is a deficit in those decibels. Um, it can be conductive, and conductive may be because of an effusion. It can be a sensorineural, um, which is something, of course, neural, or it can be a mixture of the two. Conductive, like I said, um, when the sound is disrupted by fluid or infection or rupture of that um, tympanic membrane, those could be conductive hearing losses. Sensorineural can be damage to the nerve cells along that pathway. And then mixed, maybe both, a combo of both. Some things to ask when you're assessing eyes and ears. Um, you need to, so hearing loss, let's go back to hearing loss for a second. Hearing loss could be a pre, a, not a precursor, but a symptom of an ear infection. So if they, mom, dad, bring, bring him in and say, you know, he's just not listening. Um, he says he can't hear out of this ear. Ear infection, suspect ear infection. So things you need to ask. When did this start? Has it gotten worse? Do we have fever? Do we have nasal congestion? Um, headache? Any kind of behavioral changes if they don't sleep well? If you lay them down and they cry, um, like I said, ear infections are painful. If they won't suck on their bottle, that could be as a result of an ear infection. So always make sure you get a good health history. 
Okay, so now I want to go over and look at the textbook for a second. All right, and I want to point out some important things in the textbook. All right, so we're going to go through. Hold on tight, I'm scrolling. Okay, so we talked about the eustachian tube. Here is an example of an adult eustachian tube. See how it's nice and slanted? And here's the flat little no ramp in a child. So you can see why fluid backs up. It doesn't drain out well. All right, so here's some assessment, or assessment techniques. Make sure you always read through these nursing processes uh, boxes because they talk about assessment, they talk about things that you need to assess as far as health history, and then when you're looking um, what to examine, what you're going to see, remember assessment and then treatment and then parent teaching. Okay, So they kind of follow that. Um, talks about some things and, and a lot of this was on the PowerPoint so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on there. There's your antibiotics and your antihistamines. All right, so this is this is something that we didn't talk about. If they have a blue sclera, a bluish, you might suspect osteogenesis imperfecta. So that's one of the things they investigate if they see that in a newborn. Okay. A preauricular pit and then a skin tag, those need to be investigated further. Usually those go to ENT and they, um, they usually they're nothing, but sometimes they may indicate something else going on. So if you see a child with those and they have an ENT consult, that's why. Okay. Browsing through, there's the pathophysiology of conjunctivitis. And again, we talked about the three types. Health history, here's some things to ask about with the health history. There's a nice, I just go, I like this for the pictures, really and truthfully. And um, that is a conjunctivitis. Now, clear tearing. Probably an allergic conjunctivitis. I don't see any bacteria looking um, a drainage or anything. Sometimes they'll do a culture if they're really unsure. Um, itching of conjunctivitis, cool compresses. Um, I would not <laughs> recommend a tube of yogurt over the affected eye. Just saying. Avoid visine vis because it can cause some uh, rebound redness. Um, here's the um, little guy with the blocked tear duct, tear duct, and then here is how you massage. So you push up and around and back down. Okay, that's how we teach our parents to massage that tear duct, and usually that opens it up. And again, if you don't get it opened up, then a little stent in there, um, whoops, is not uncommon. Here is a sty or hordeolum. Looks very painful. It's just the infect and a bacterial infection um, in one of those little ducts there. Warm compresses help with that as well. Here's a picture of a periorbital cellulitis. Now this one looks like something that has come from the outside. When you see them come from a sinus infection, they don't have all of that excoriation on the outside. They're just really purple and red or purple and swollen. Um, and usually it's a staph infection. All right, some eye injuries. Uh, we talked about the seriousness, the serious ones that need to go to um, ophthalmology. Now, a corneal abrasion, pretty common, um, usually results from something like if you get a piece of something in your eye and you just rub, 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 um, you can get a corneal abrasion. Um, they used to patch these, but they don't patch them anymore. They usually just do an antibiotic eye drop and be done with it. They heal very, very, very quickly. Now, something that may be very scary is a scleral hemorrhage. Um, it can be, it says it can be caused by blunt trauma or it can be caused by absolutely nothing. Um, cough 
you know, you can cough and you rupture one of those little uh, capillaries in your eye. They look absolutely horrible, but they don't hurt and they don't affect your vision. I had one one time that covered my entire sclera um, and it looked horrible, but I didn't feel a thing. It just looked awful. I scared people to death. All right. Um, let me see if there's, okay, here's the study about patching for corneal abrasion. And again, they found that it really didn't improve healing. Okay. So they don't patch anymore. Um, information on educating on eyeglass use. Um, and, that, and that's, that's good parent education, especially uh, if you have a small child with having to wear glasses. Um, this is a, a good example of esotropia, where his little eyes come in. Exotropia is out. And again, you may have a um, combination. You may have one that goes out and one that goes in. All right. Just trying to make sure we hit all of our points here. Okay, so if you have a child that um, has some visual impairment, these are very important things. You know, when they say when a child has visual impairment, their other senses get stronger. That is absolutely true. We have a little girl in our church that was born blind, and she can tell, she can hear a pin drop down the hall, and she can differentiate who you are by your voice. So make sure that you talk to them. Make sure you identify who you are. And those are some all awesome good points dealing with a visually impaired child. Of course, family support is very important. Um, now we're going to get into the ears. All right, here is some treatment. Um, there is a common theory that you can just wait and watch. Um, a lot of parents, well, some parents prefer that. Um, if they're not real big antibiotic fans, sometimes they might. So important to kind of give them some guidelines. You... There are things that you that you might see that might indicate, hey, we really do need an antibiotic. Um, and this is a really good chart. The best part of it is the part at the bottom. Um, if you have a big, big, big fever or if, if things last more than 48 hours, then that might need an antibiotic. Okay, so you might want to read through that because there are parents that opt not to do antibiotics. The problem with chronic antibiotic use is resistance. You know that. All right, here's our risk factors. Really important to know those. And then here's our picture again. Um, this is just clear liquid behind there. It's 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 not an infection. It's just an effusion. And usually those are treated with a good um, decongestant. Okay, um, all the boxes, make sure you guys pay attention to all the boxes. These are kids that might be at risk for some speech or language difficulties. And again, they have to do with the ear. Um, if they have hearing loss or chronic ear infections, then their speech is going to be affected. So that's one thing. If you have a parent that's concerned about their speech, ask them, you know, do we, does he say his ears hurt? Do we have, have we had a lot of ear infections? Um, those, that may be important history to have. And then there's a picture of the little tube, and that's exactly what it looks like, and placement is there, and it grows up like that, and it kind of falls out. Otitis externa. Okay, we didn't talk about this. Otitis externa is fungal, and it hurts. Swimmer's ear. Um, you sometimes get a lot of, like, white drainage. Sometimes the ear canal even swells shut. Um, treatment is with eardrops, but um, getting eardrops in a closed, swollen ear canal is difficult. So they have a little ear wick that you put in. It looks like a little piece of, of stiff cotton, and that can be very, very, very painful to get in. Um, so, and a lot of times you can't even see in the eardrum to see what it is. And, um, you yeah, oh, there it talks about, yeah, your ear wick. So they'll put that ear wick in, and then they'll fill it, they'll drench it with antibiotics or antifungal eardrops and then leave it in there. Um, it is not a fun thing to do, especially if you have a completely occluded ear canal.
Okay, here are some things that prevent otitis externa. Talks about wearing earplugs when swimming. Oh, one thing that I did want to mention, and I'm going to go right back up here and show you where it is. Um, children with PE tubes who swim in lakes must, 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 must wear earplugs. Okay, um, lake water is disgusting, and so earplugs are the key. Okay, um, so make sure that they wear their earplugs. That's important to remember. All right, and then preventing otitis externa. Again, pay attention to the teaching guidelines. This talks about hearing loss um, and things that we can do to treat hearing loss. Put earplugs or covers over your premature and NICU babies' um, ears. Health history, um, common signs and symptoms that you might see parents report um, that you might think mm, might be hearing loss. Those are all red flags. Good to know, too. All right, and here's some um, communication options for hearing impaired. You can do sign language, um, spoken language, or you can do um, cochlear implants. That's a, that's a big thing now. Very, very, very helpful. And then always look at your care plan at the end of the chapter. Lots of information in there, especially with parent teaching. Okay, so that is all I have. Figure out how to stop this crazy thing. And you all have a great